I want to talk with you for a while this morning about the glory of the cross. Glory is uh, simply a word which means something that is worthy of honor, praise, or distinction. For example, the glory of America is its freedom. The glory of a runner is his or her speed. The glory of an eagle is its high flight. The glory of a mother is her love. The glory of a scholar is his or her brilliance. But the glory of Christianity, the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the cross. It is what brings honor, distinction, and praise. In his very earliest letter, Paul writing to the Galatians, chapter 6, verse 14 says, May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross becomes our ground of boasting. It is our point of honor and distinction and praise. It's so radical an idea to glory in the cross that if you look at it from the window of the first century, it would be like saying glorying in the electric chair. Persons don't walk around today wearing pendants with an electric chair or uh, bracelets or necklaces adorned with an electric chair. We don't have an electric chair Over the choir at the back of the sanctuary, we have a cross. There's a lot of debate, there's been a lot of legal debate in America as to whether the electric chair represents cruel and unusual punishment and should be abolished. I can tell you the cross does represent cruel and unusual punishment, and yet that very instrument of cruel and unusual punishment has become for us, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, our ground of boasting. It is our point of honor and distinction as we point to him, our Lord. It's the special glory of the Christian faith. Why does the cross assume such glory for us? Let me talk about two reasons why the cross is glorious, one of which I'll deal with rather briefly and the other more at length. First, the cross is glorious because of the one who hangs upon it, Jesus, our Lord. This was no ordinary person who was put to death on the cross. This was no person who was worthy of punishment who was put to death on the cross. This is our Lord, the most excellent person who ever walked the the sands and the shores of time. I made a list some time ago of the things I admire about Jesus just to sort of focus upon the qualities in life that all of us can seek to become. I admire him for his quiet years. The fact that for 30 years he could just live anonymously among us without tipping his hand as to his glory. I admire that ability to be subject to his family and subject to the civil and social restraints and customs of the day. I admire him for that. I admire him for the greatness of his vision, his redemptive task to save humanity. I admire him for the grandeur of his character. I admire him for his gentleness and approachability. Some people that are important aren't too approachable. He's approachable. I admire him for the strength of his convictions, for the force of his anger, for his concern for the little person. He never engaged in social strata of who he would talk to and who he wouldn't. I admire him for the magnetism of his personality, for the power in his works, for the concreteness and the completeness of his teaching. I admire him for his patience and skill in developing character in others. I admire him for the perfect blending of righteousness and forgiveness. Some people are so holy that they can't forgive, and some people are so forgiving that they've lost all sense of conviction. I admire him for his wonderful insight into life through his stories. I admire him for the promises he made and kept. I admire him for the dependability of his word and his person. I admire him for his rock-like endurance and his incredible ability to avoid self-pity. I admire him for his loving commitment. That's who hangs upon the cross. The greatest life ever lived. James Stalker, who wrote A Wonderful Life of Jesus about a hundred years ago, said of this, of the qualities in Jesus, it's easy to make a catalog of the qualities which entered into his human character, but the blending 
and the harmony and the perfection, the delight and the subduing charm, who can express? Yet all this walked on earth in the flesh, and men and women saw it with their own eyes. We have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. The crucifixion happens to one whom we dearly love. He is the most wonderful person who ever lived. The cross has glory because of him who hangs upon it. But secondly, the cross is glorious because of what he did for us on the cross. And I want to talk about especially three things that happened for us that Jesus did for us on the cross. I'll summarize them in three words. The first is the word transfer. Transfer. 800 years before the crucifixion, the prophet Isaiah said this about transfer. Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we did consider him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Peter, writing near the close of the New Testament period, says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Transfer. So often, as believers, we approach the cross only with the emotions of wonder and love. And that's appropriate. The song that was played this morning, And Can It Be That Thou My God Shouldst Die For Me, is a marvelous approach to the cross of wonder and love. We must always approach the cross with wonder and love. Theologian J.S. Well put it eloquently when he said, Instead of putting off our shoes from our feet because the place whereon we stand is holy ground, we are taking nice photographs of the burning bush from suitable angles. We are chatting about theories of the atonement with our feet on the mantelpiece instead of kneeling down before the wounds of Christ. I don't want us to be talking about the death of Christ as though our feet were on the mantelpiece, but our knees are on the ground and our hearts are filled with wonder and adoration. But as much as our hearts respond to the cross with wonder and adoration, we recognize that there, is an, there are additional dimensions to the cross that reach into our mental framework and into the construct of how we think and what we are as human beings, and that the cross provides us a legal framework for how God brings us forgiveness of sins. The word atonement simply means at one meant. The cross bridges the gulf between the righteousness of God and the sinfulness of our lives. And the concept of transfer involves, in the cross of Jesus Christ, my sin and your sin being transferred to him, and then a double bypass, if you will, coming back, his righteousness being transferred to us. We talk about that for a moment from a legal framework. Some of you know that I'm a in addition to being a minister, I'm a member of the California State Bar. It's a very dangerous thing because I know just enough to be dangerous. In fact, I'm in the unique position, most pastors never get to this position, where if people don't like my sermons or what I do, I can sue them. Um, <laughs> well, except for First Corinthians teaching, you know. But as I said recently to somebody who threatened to sue us, well, who takes the Bible seriously anymore anyway? Well, anyway, I won't get sidetracked here. There's a famous uh, California case in 1986 called the Von Groningen case that had to, had to deal with uh, something called respondeat superior and imputed negligence. Doesn't that make you want to say hallelujah right off the bat? Respondeat superior means let the master answer for the deeds of the employer or the servant, and imputed negligence means that the employer himself was not negligent, but the deeds of the employee were put back on the employer. We face this all the time in, in uh, the church where people are trying to get to the church through the misdeeds of an individual and, or trying to get to a company through the misdeeds of an employee to impute the negligence onto the company because it has the deep pockets.
Christina was forgivable. And Peter is saying that even though you intended to kill the author of life, the Son of God, God is willing to treat all sin as non-intentional. And He is willing to pick up the tab for every deliberate act and every careless act in our life and pay the penalty that the soul that sins shall die, but in Christ Jesus, the penalty for that sin has been paid. When I was uh, a boy in China one day, I was bored. Mom was homeschooling us. I'm the youngest of three children. My brother and sister were off doing their high school stuff, and I was all of eight years of age, taking a Calvert correspondence course. And I looked around the inner courtyard one day and didn't see anybody, and I was through with my studies and thought, you know what? Let's have some fun today. This day is kind of boring. And we had a dog called Blackie, a 10-year-old American bird dog that remained... Uh, uh, hooked to a chain, and the chain was attached to a, a hook in the underhang of the first floor, had a large wooden dog box, and Blackie guarded that uh, inner door. And I had seen Blackie get loose a time or two and knew how exciting it could be if Blackie could make it out of the street and chase people. So not really having anything to do and wanted to make the day exciting, I looked around to make sure that no one was watching me. Then I called up on Blackie's dog box. I had opened both the outside gate and the inner gate, crawled up on the dog box, and I had at least the good sense to not let Blackie loose at the collar because then it would have been hard to catch her. I thought with a, train, with a chain trailing behind her, we could at least run after her and sooner or later we'd catch up to her, but not before there was a lot of excitement. Now, I, I can still hear the whack of that chain hitting the wooden dog box and Blackie was off like a shot. And I waited until she cleared the main outside gate door and then I called, Blackie's loose, Blackie's loose. My dad comes out of nowhere. My brother comes out of nowhere. The three of us start running down the street. Blackie is just, people are running for an inch of their life because Blackie, Blackie was a dog that was trained to bite. And uh, finally we caught up to Blackie. Dad stepped on her chain and the day's fun was ended. And I thought, oh, this has been great. But as we head back toward the house, Dad looks down at me and he says, George, when we get home, you are going to get the whipping of your life. I couldn't figure out how he knew it was me. <laughs> Nobody had had time to tell him. How did he know? And I, now that I've been a father, I, I realize he looked at the guilt on my face, you know. But Boy, just as we got home, my brother, who was more experienced in discipline than I, because he had a principle of life that if the, uh, if the pleasure is a modicum equivalent to the pain, I'll, I'll experience the pain in order to get the pleasure. My life principle was, if there's pain and pleasure, I'll forego the pleasure in order to avoid the pain. But my brother said to my father, because he l knew how scared I was, the dad was, uh, you know, he was, he was in the old school, which was disciplined by a razor strap, <clears throat> and it, it, it sort of hurt. <laughs> and and Paul, my brother, saw how shaky I was and said, and said a very noble thing to my father. He said, Dad, he said, George is really scared. He said, um, I'll volunteer to take his punishment. That was a wonderful thing my brother did. <laughs> now, if my brother had, had loosened the dog chain with me, he would not have been qualified to take my punishment, for he himself would have had to have been punished for his own misdeed. That's why the Scripture makes a point out of the fact that, that Jesus knew no sin, because if he himself had sinned in any respect to that degree, he couldn't take our punishment, he would have had to bear his own. My father, however, was not well-schooled, even though he was a Son of God missionary, in the doctrine of the atonement. <laughs> and so he rejected my brother's offer and punished me. But if he had punished my brother and I had been standing outside the room listening to my brother's cries, it would have had the same remedial effect upon my conduct as if he had punished me, for I would have never forgotten the price my brother bore for my sin. The scriptures say to us that our sin was transferred to him. But then Jesus did something for us in transfer that no legal system can do. You can impute negligence, but you really can't impute righteousness. There's a, there's a two-way street going on here. Our sin is placed upon him and his righteousness, Romans chapter 4, 
What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited or imputed to him as righteousness. The words it was imputed to him were not written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will impute righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus Christ our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The bottom line is that our sins have been put upon him and his righteousness has been put upon us. And so our standing with God is not based upon our performance. It is based upon what He has done for us in His cross. We are made righteous through the blood of Christ, which has been shed for our sins. The wages of sin is death, Paul says. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Transfer. Have you transferred your sins to Him and His his righteousness been transferred to your life? Second great understanding of the work of Jesus on the cross for us is the, represented by the word transformation. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not only imputed, but actually righteous. Transferred. The story, uh, story is told of a, of, a, of a lady who had a very unhappy marriage. Her husband was very demanding. And every morning before he would leave the house, he would uh, write out a list of things he wanted her to do that day. And when he got home at night, he wanted to know that the list was done. Uh, that husband, by the way, needed to go to the marriage thing that's coming up March 14 and 15. And of course, that created a lot of tension in the home. In the course of time and in the providence of God, he died. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow, you know. That's <laughs> I don't mean to make light of it, but anyway, it just struck me as funny. This is kind of an apocryphal story, so you can laugh at the details without feeling like you're talking about anybody real. Uh, in the course of time, she, she meets another man, and she remarries, and the second marriage is, is, is as good as the first one was bad. And she's very happy. Several years go by, and one day she's cleaning out the attic, and... Uh, She's going through some old boxes and, and she comes into a box in which there is a collection of these to-do lists. And she just inwardly, just immediately, just her whole gut just tenses up because of the unpleasant memories of the to-do list. And, but she, then she starts looking at what her first husband had asked her to do and she begins to say to herself, you know what? I'm doing all these things now without being asked. What had happened was the first relationship was built upon regulation and the second relationship was built upon love. There are persons who try to live their Christian life as though it were a series of checklists of things to do to satisfy an angry God. But our life is transformed by a loving response to a Savior who has redeemed us with His blood and because we know we are loved so deeply, we respond accordingly to that love. He forgave all our sins, having canceled the written code, Paul says, with its regulations, that to-do list. He canceled that to-do list that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because the righteousness of Christ has come into our life and transformed us. And when we fail to behave in a way that is likened to the character of Christ, it is not so much a matter of not having met the demands of the law, it is a matter of not being sufficiently grateful to Christ by offering our life as a loving, pure response to His redemptive work for us. Dr. Harry Ironside, isn't that a wonderful name? I'd like to have a name like that. This is some character, Harry Ironside. For years was pastor of the great Moody Church in Chicago. and He told this story about one time he took a young Native American Christian with him on a train trip to Oakland, California, out of Chicago. Uh, and in Oakland, the young uh, man was taken one Sunday night to a group where a, uh, 
some young believers, single adults, were gathered around for a Bible study. And the topic that night was on the relationship of law to grace. And they had a, a rip-roaring conversation about the relationship of law and grace and how we ought to frame our lives accordingly. But they didn't seem to be getting anywhere in the conversation. It was more like a debate. It's funny, this young Native American, who hadn't been a Christian very long, spoke up and said, um, I've been listening to you talk about law and grace. And the longer I listen, the more I think, you don't know what law or grace is. Let me tell you what I think. When Mr. Ironside asked me to go to Oakland with him, we get on big train down on reservation. I'd never been on train before, and we ride and ride and ride all day long, and finally we come, finally we come to Barstow out in the desert. I was very tired, so I get off train to walk platform and stretch legs, and while I walk around platform, I see signs that say, Do not spit here. I look at sign and I think, What strange sign white man put up? Do not spit here. And while I look at sign, before I know what happened, I spit. I think to myself, how strange signs say, do not spit here, but many people spit, and I spit. We get on train again and come long way up to Oakland, and some friends meet us at train and take us to this beautiful home. I'd never been in such a home. Mr. Ironside take me in and show me soft chair and excuse himself, and I was left alone in room. I look around, and everything is so nice, soft, thick rug on the floor, beautifully beautiful walls, painted lovely color, pictures hanging on the wall. Everything's so nice. I walk around room, and I think to myself about something, and I look all around room and all over the wall, and I try to find signs that say, Do not spit here. But I cannot find sign. I say to myself, Too bad all this lovely room going to be ruined by people spitting on the floor. Then I look around on floor and see nobody been spitting here. And then it came to me, when law say, do not spit here, it made me want to spit. And I spit. And many people spit. But when I come into grace, and everything lovely and nice, I don't want to spit, and I don't need law to say, do not spit here. <laughs> what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray and my sins, which are many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. That's the response of transformation. Transfer, transformation. Third thing that Jesus did for us on the cross is triumph, triumph. Paul, in writing to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 15, says this amazing sentence. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public, a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. certainly didn't look like the cross was a place of triumph that day. The cross looked like a place of tragedy and defeat and broken promises and the loss of ideals. And we're often faced as Christians with this tension between the world as it is and the world that Christ will yet make it. We say that Christ won a victory in the cross and that the cross he disarmed the principalities and the powers, but we look around and we see incredible mayhem, humanity's inhumanity to one another, racial violence, enmity among nations. A lot of us in this uh, room this morning could point to tragedies in our own family. Where is the triumph of the cross? And as Christians, we're caught in the tension between this age and the age that is yet to come. The tension between the kingdom as it now is, where Christ reigns in our heart, and the kingdom that is coming when Christ reigns over all. How can we say with any degree of confidence that Christ has won a victory on the cross when there's so much death and disease and trouble and sorrow all around us? I think we have to understand where the cross fits in the redemptive plan of God. It's as though the cross were God's D-Day. Many in this congregation remember the exact date of D-Day, June 6, 1944, when the Allies landed on Normandy's beaches. World War II hung in the balance on D-Day. 
And in fact, World War II would go on for 11 more months until VE Day, May 8, 1945. Between D-Day and VE Day, there were more casualties in that 11-month period of the war than at any time during World War II. And yet, in looking back on World War II, we can say confidently that World War II was won when D-Day was successful. D-Day, Invasion Day. The tide of battle turned and the victory was assured because the invasion was successful. The cross is God's D-Day. The cross and resurrection is God's D-Day that assures the ultimate outcome of the battle. I think I saw this for a first time in a little incident that happened to me, when, again, back to when I was a missionary kid. It's wonderful to have those kinds of roots. Uh, I was watching Dad kill chickens one day out in the courtyard. This is a dirt courtyard. Everything was made out of dirt. If you've seen pictures of villages in Afghanistan, you get the kind of idea of where we, the sort of situation we lived in the late 40s in northwest China. I was watching. Dad would grab the chicken by the legs. He had a way of killing a chicken. He would twirl it around. And get, I guess the idea was to get it dizzy. And then he would lay it down on the chopping block, stretch out its neck, take the axe, and go whap. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I've offended any, any animal rights lovers here, but so he, I didn't do it. He did it. You know. <laughs> so, but I was watching as a, a, da a dad would hold tightly to the chicken legs. And that chicken just would, those legs would just uh, ferociously uh, jerk in his hand. And so being a little boy filled with wonder, I said to Dad, Dad, what would happen if the next time you killed a chicken, you let it go? He said, well, let's find out. So the next chicken he took, circled it around over his head, laid it down on the chopping block, took an axe, bang, as soon as the axe was done, he let the chicken go. And I've heard stories about chickens running around barnyards headless. And This chicken didn't do that. This chicken took straight off, up like a rocket at Cape Kennedy. I mean, it just, it just took off. And, and from my little boy's height, it appeared like, you know, he went up all the way to the roof line. It wasn't a roof line as high as this, but it was, I mean, it was, it, I have to this day never seen a chicken fly higher in my life than that headless chicken. And at the zenith of its climb, its activity ceased and it plummeted to earth and lay on the ground motionless and still. I filed that memory away in my mind for a long time until I was in seminary and dealing with this tension between the kingdom now and the kingdom that is to come and wrestling with this scripture about the triumph on the cross and I understood why Paul can say that at the cross he disarmed the powers and the authorities and made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross that that he did to the devil what my dad did to the chicken. In the cross, he cut off his head, but after the head was cut off, there, that chicken was more active after his head was cut off than at any time in its whole life. And the enemy is more active today and will be active until Christ returns, but it is the activity of a headless one, as Martin Luther said so eloquently in his great hymn, and lo, his doom is sure. And Paul puts it this way to us who wait between the times. The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Triumph. The glory of the cross. It's glorious because of him who hangs upon it. And it's glorious because of what he did for us on it. That there is transfer and transformation and triumph. In the year 1829, a man named George Wilson killed a government employee who caught him in the act of robbing the mail. He was tried and sentenced to be hanged, and many people who were uh, against the death penalty at the time appealed to President Andrew Jackson to pardon him on death row. Andrew Jackson did that. He issued a pardon for George Wilson. But a strange thing then happened. George Wilson refused to accept the pardon. And President Jackson was asked what to do, that there was a prisoner who had rejected his pardon. He was thrown over to the United States Supreme Court. And in the year 1832, under Chief Justice John Marshall, the Supreme Court issued its verdict. Can a person be pardoned who rejects a pardon? John Marshall's reasoning was this, quote, A pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. 
If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. And so he was. You see, God in the cross of Jesus Christ can do everything for us and give us the marvelous pardon, which is a pardon for sin and the gift of everlasting life. But it is an action which must be completed by our own response. The pardon, in order to be valid for us, must be accepted. I don't know today if you've accepted that pardon, but if you haven't, there's no better moment than this moment to receive Jesus Christ into your, Lord, into your life and have Him as your Lord and Savior. Our Heavenly Father, we bow in this moment before you. We thank you for the incredible, incredible thing you did for us on the cross. We're just struck speechless to try to describe how we ought to feel, how we ought to think. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Amazing love that our sins should be transferred to you and your righteousness should be transferred to us. Amazing love that you should give us the power to live transformed lives. Amazing love that by the power of your death on the cross and resurrection, you should lead us into all eternity in triumph. Amazing love. How can it be? We still our hearts in this moment to express gratitude to you. Just where you're seated all over this congregation, can we take just a moment and do this? Just audibly express thanks to the Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your great love for us, Jesus. We praise you today. And we thank you. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, perhaps you're here today and you would like to, re to accept the work that Jesus did for you in his cross. You would like for your sins to be transferred to him and his righteousness to be transferred to you and you would like to receive him today as your Lord and Savior. If you're here in this congregation today and that's the desire of your heart, could I see just a hand uplifted as a sign and indication of your desire to receive Jesus? The main floor and the balcony. Any here today? Yes, thank you so much. I see your hand. Are there others? Keep your, yes, thank you. At the close of this service today, for those of you that raise your hands, we're going to provide an opportunity for you to come forward, and I'd like for you to come at that time and share your decision with a prayer partner who will be here and can, can lead you further in prayer to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm going to ask those who are serving communion, which represents, of course, Christ's death on the cross, to come at this time. And would we prepare our own hearts to receive the bread and the cup?